So good morning, everyone, and good evening and good afternoon to you all as well. <laughs> From around the world, we've just been connecting with everyone. <laughs> finding out in the chat box there where you're all from and what an absolute pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, we're talking with um, one of the greatest leaders I think of the world has ever seen, <laughs> I don't mind saying that, and welcome on behalf of Synergy, the team at Synergy Global and the team at Open Door to our Coach Week keynote this morning. I'm Natalie Ashdown. I'm here with Dr. Charlie Pellerin and I will introduce Charlie to you shortly. Um, but before I do that, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians on the land on which we meet today and their continuing connection to the lands, the waters, the communities of Australia. And we pay our respects to them and to their elders, elders past, present and emerging. So keep telling us where you're from, everyone. We've got people from Vancouver and it's so nice. We're just connected as a community together. We're really enjoying that. So before I introduce Charlie, I've got my fingers crossed that this is going to work. I wanted to inspire us this morning. And let me see if I can make this work. Can you hear that? No, nope, hang on a second. Give me one moment. I'm really excited about the technology here. I just have to make sure I get it right. <laughs> there we go. Can you hear that? everyone could see that okay I was really keeping my fingers crossed but um, uh, I hope everyone could uh, could actually see that um, video and uh, appreciate as I have the um, amazing the absolute amazingness Is it, are we right Nick <laughs> What's that? oh yeah shit Good. I've got the technology going here. We are doing this live, everybody. So <laughs> I'm just going to share my screen as well. Here we go. Is it going to tab for me? Here we go. 
So welcome everyone to our very special webinar. And I wanted to show you that video because today with us, we have Dr. Charlie Palloran. He is the man who over 30 years now ago now led the team to bring us the Hubble Space Telescope. He is one of NASA's most highly decorated scientists, having won um, a number of leadership awards and being given the highest leadership awards, including the Outstanding Leadership Medal, which is, was bestowed on less than 50 people in NASA's history. Um, I actually feel quite emotional because I was sharing with um, <laughs> Charlie <laughs> before, um, before we started speaking that um, I, I remember the launch of Hubble and I have been a stargazer for many, many years. And so the opportunity to meet with you, Charlie, and to hear your stories of leadership, um, it, we're, we're very, very grateful. So enough gushing from me. I'm gonna hand over to you and you have some stories to share with us. Um, and one of those um, stories we'd obviously love to hear is, is about Hubble and the lessons you learned from Hubble. Well, it was a, it was a difficult project uh, all throughout. We, we, it was organized badly before I got there and I didn't have enough uh, sense to fix it until too late. But uh, the, some, some, some of the more unique aspects of it, I, I launched 12 satellites during my time as director. And uh, for 11 of them, I'm in the VIP stands talking to congressional people and trying to get more money next year. Uh, but for Hubble, we had a very special problem. If we had a problem during the ascent phase, we didn't get to the nominal orbit there's only two things you could do with Hubble. You could leave it in a low orbit and try and get a shuttle up fast enough that it wouldn't disintegrate or put, go take it to an alternate landing site, which is not clean. And the thing will surely get dirty, which means you have to take it completely apart at least five years. So NASA had to have someone to make that decision and it was decided it was gonna be me. So I'm in the blockhouse with a headset watching this, the little table that I made as to what we're gonna do if this happens. The worst part of that was that in order to be in the launch control center, which has all the people worrying about the engines and all the other parts of the shuttle, you've got to go through simulations. And simulations mean failures. So you experience failures over and over. It's one of the more depressing things I've ever done. The telescope, uh, <clears throat> the, the launch was fine. I got on a NASA jet and flew over to Houston for the deployment, and the solar arrays got stuck. Well, the people at Johnson and my team fixed that. Everything was good. So I go to Goddard Space Flight Center, which is where the operations are, about six weeks later to open the door and take our first image. And my boss, against my urging, had agreed to do this in public. I'd wanted to do it quietly in private, make sure it was okay, and then he, he agreed to do it. So we're all sitting there, and the door opens, a little image appears on the screen, everybody starts cheering. I've got my chief system engineer next to me, I said, Gene, those images are blurry. Yeah, don't worry. So we just got to make a little adjustment. And we, we know how to fix that. And it's, it's a longer technical story. So I go back to the office and I'm thinking, I'm exhausted. You know, I'm, 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 I need a break. And I've always liked going to Japan. And I've got cooperative agreements there. So I went to my boss at the time and said, Lynn, uh, I'm going to go to Japan for a week just to sort of update the things I haven't been able to take care of. And, and the Japanese know that what I like to do is go to what they call yokans these little Japanese ends that, uh, that, and that my favorite thing is to go to a place no foreigner's ever been before. So they know this. They'll take me to these places, but there's no way I can contact you. Even though I've got a pager, I, I can't, there's no phones or anything. So I'll be gone for a week. Is that okay with you? And he said, uh, yep. Yeah. He, he said to me, anything I can do for you, Charlie? And I said, yeah, there is. There's going to be medals in the Rose Garden for this. And I, don't, I want President Bush to put mine on me and not Vice President Dan Quayle. So we kind of laughed about it. And I go away. So I come back and arrive in the uh, St. Louis Red Carpet Lounge a week later. And I pick up the phone, call, call the office. So my secretary says, have you talked to Dr. Fisk lately? And I said, no. He said, well, I'll put you right through. And I thought, hmm, someone's going to take my call immediately. The, maybe it's about the metals in the Rose Garden. <laughs> this is a true story. So he says yeah. to me, well, what do you know about spherical aberration? I said, what I know is when, the, when the people build a telescope sloppily, they get what they call a downturn edge, which means there's a function of the radius of the mirror. It focuses a different point on the optical axis in the telescope. It's useless. 
He said, well, you launched Hubble Space Telescope but it's frankly aberrated mirror. This is two PhDs. I said, did not. He said, did so. Did not, did so. <sighs> then he finally said, go pick up the newspaper of any national newspaper, bring it back to the phone and read what it says. So I could pick up the St. Louis Times dispatch, come back. Above the line, it says, national disaster, Hubble launched with flawed mirror. He says, now, now what do you say? I said, how did you get a fake newspaper into this lounge? Yeah. <laughs> this is, denial is an unconscious process and I'm, I can't, I, my brain can't cope with the fact this is possible. So go back to Washington, I walk in his office in the morning and all of NASA management's there and they're all angry. And they said, uh, how'd you let this happen? Well, I have no idea what's happened. I've just got back in the country. So we had the failure review board uh, meeting up at the contractor plant and we met for three days with these wizards and no one knew what was the matter. I came back and I'm summoned to the Barbara Mikulski's office. She's the head of appropriations for NASA. And she just wanted to talk to me and the administrator, the two of us together. So I walk into her office and she starts screaming at me and hitting me with newspapers and spitting on me. And the reason was that uh, she had asked me about a year earlier, is helpful going to work? Now there were good reasons why I didn't know if it was going to work, things we could not be sure about. But what's the only answer you could give? What, 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 if it was you, what would you say? I'd say, of course it is. Course <laughs> on time work. and on budget, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say, I don't know? You know. So, so she's angry. And, and, the, and the, during the conversation, she puts her, her finger into my chest and says, there'll never be an appropriated dollar to fix this telescope. This is a nightmare that has to go away. So I get in the car with Administrator Truly, and he says, Charlie, you heard the Congresswoman, right? So uh, this is a piece of good fortune. I had a very messy divorce about four years earlier, and uh, I, I was one of the few people that could function in the middle of all this because a divorce was worse than this. So th this, was, this was actually pretty mild compared to a divorce, and I did a lot of psychological work, including getting certified in somatic psychology. And somatic psychology is about look about your body. So go back to my office. I sit there by myself, close the door. And what I was trained to do is, is how you're feeling. And if you're feeling lousy, you're probably in a drama state. So I, how am I feeling? I'm feeling lousy. I'm, I'm in the victim drama state. Now you can't just shift your emotion, but you can shift your thoughts. So I said, what's the thought driving this? The thought is that I can't fix a telescope because she won't let me. So what's a thought that could change everything I thought, what's she going to do, fire me? I guess go do it anyway. So then I felt good because I'm back in the place of responsibility. This is the key elements of leadership in my view. So I called my budget analyst then, Greg, and I said, <clears throat> I want to carve out a budget for $60 million to fix Hubble, start fixing Hubble. And we can't tell anybody we did it because I've been forbidden to do this by both the head of our appropriations, which controls our money, and head of NASA. And I said, if if, you, if, if they, you get in trouble, I'll indemnify you. I'll tell people that I made you do this. Don't worry. So an hour later, we had $60 million. So I'd done a servicing mission before, the only one ever with a group at Goddard Space Flight Center. So I went out there to see them. And I said, you're the only people in the world know how to do this. I got $60 million in my pocket. Can we start to fix Hubble? And I said, and by the way, you can't tell your management you're doing this because we've been forbidden to do it. So they said, no problem. So they started work. So we, we, at this time, <clears throat> we had no technical possibility. There was no option. Uh, the, all scientists had already been working for two or three weeks, and there was nothing anyone could think of that could do this. So <clears throat> meanwhile, uh, the, 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 the vice president of Ball Aerospace, which, which built all the Hubble instruments, is coming to meet with me in Washington once a week. He's worried about my mental health. So he, he's coming in to cheer me up. <clears throat> so he said, we think we have a way to fix this. And it involved taking out, Hubble has four, what are called axial instruments, they're about the size of phone booths. And it was designed to have, to have, to have the instruments re replaced anyway. We can take out one of the axial instruments, and if we can put in a mirror this big, that is exactly deformed proportionally to the 96 inch mirror, and put another flat mirror, in principle, we can fix it. So we didn't have the technical details yet, so at that point, I went public with the fact that I had moved the money around illegally, but everybody was so happy that we had a possible fix, nobody cared. 
Mm. So, so we began work and we, we figured out how to do it. The, the guys did. And uh, so now we're, we're rolling. And what's funny, I, I was on a lot of science shows for the 25th anniversary of Hubble. Mm. And uh, most of them, I told this story because people get, I, I, I told this story for the first time when I was on a bicycling trip in Boulder and people said, that's really interesting. I never thought it was interesting. So people find it interesting. So I, <clears throat> I uh, told this story during the, the interviews and a screenwriter in Los Angeles saw me and he's written a movie about my life and the movies, the screenwriting's done and we got a producer, we're looking for a network now. And I can email you the sizzle reel to advertise the movie when we later on, you can take a look at it. I'm also oh, available. Okay. I'm also available, Charlie. I, I, I do voiceovers. I'm, you know, I'm very okay. happy to. <laughs> okay, great. So, so, uh, so, so what happened next is that uh, I, I was promoted up to the top of NASA. Uh, I, I was moved up to a sort of big title. There's four of us up in the front office of NASA. That's all that's there. And I hated it. Uh, it was all about uh, politics, and I don't do politics well. I'm a scientist. I like to work with scientists and engineers to build complex things. So I didn't know what to do with myself. And meanwhile, the Failure Review Board goes up to the Congress, and they said the root cause of the failure was a leadership failure. And I was mm -hmm. leader of the team, but nobody in NASA blamed me because nobody understood. I didn't either. What's the connection between a leadership failure? And they couldn't point to anything I had done wrong. And a technical failure. Well, it turns out it's, it was about the social context, the environment we created. So, so Hubble Space Telescope originally was supposed to cost about $500 million. It overran the first time, got my boss fired, <clears throat> overran three other times, and I managed to get survive all that. <clears throat> but then the process of that, the, the, the same contractor is having all these troubles, and you tend to, it's, it's a painful process to get the, that kind of money. So, so that they got nothing but grief from NASA. And in that environment, they're not going to tell us about problems that might be real. We had plenty of real tough technical problems. Mm -hmm. So I got interested in this question. And I, uh, NASA offered me uh, a sabbatical, a two-year sabbatical. And I chose to go to the business school at University of Colorado. I've also got Harvard, a Harvard MBA the business school and began to investigate leadership and social failures, which became later social context and social failures. And that's the work I've done for the past 25 years. And as you know, I've written a book about this. So uh, Hubble not, not only turned out to be a success for the world, uh, for those of us close to it, I would have never have done this work and I love doing this work. So happy ending. Who would have yeah, thought? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> for sure. And so I'm, I'm really fascinated, um, Charlie, about what you said around um, in, in this moment, taking you back to the moment when you went back into your office, um, there could have been so many different emotions and thoughts going through your mind, but the one that caught you was that you couldn't fix it. So just, it wasn't about my, my career is over or this is going to be it for me. It was, no, I can't no, no, fix that. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so being that, go on. You've been working in mindfulness, right? During mm. your time. So I, I, I work, I work with a very specific kind of mindfulness, and that is w when you're 100% committed to purpose. And we train that in our workshops. And I think that the, the, the secret of my life has been a knack of doing that. And so, and so people say to me, uh, what a great act of courage that you went and, and reprogrammed that money. And I said, no, there was no courage involved. Uh, <clears throat> once you get committed and focused, the place your brain goes to, it's just automatic. There's like no other option. So I like this expression from Bill Halsey. There, there are no great men, just great circumstances that ordinary men rise to, to meet. And that's how I think of this. So yeah, it's, it's, very, it's a <clears throat> very good laboratory for, for many things here. But yeah. if I hadn't had the somatic psychology training, I don't know if I would have known to do this, to, to so, so one of the things I teach in, is, is that uh, thoughts that, that, that we think, storylines I call them, mm -hmm. are true for us, but not the truth. Because then, then, when they're not the truth, then you can change them. So uh, I, I just said, okay, change the thought, and that changed the emotion and energized me, and off I went. <laughs> and do you think it's actually a leadership quality 
um, Charlie, that we really have to embody in our leaders, that ability to control our thoughts and to also control the storyline? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's two things to leadership. <clears throat> there's your character. And the, the, the reason that's important is that it, it supports you in doing the right thing. And so in, in that moment, what I did was the right thing and I knew mm. it. So that was, that was easy. And the second question is, are you competent to do it? And yes, I was competent to go try and fix this. I'm, I've got a degree in this stuff. I've been with this telescope eight years. Um, I, I didn't do the technical work myself, but I knew enough to get the right people doing it. And I knew, I knew enough to, to, to look at it and say if it's going to work or not. So, so that, that, I think I think character and competence is is the, the thing. You know, interesting thing. I was thinking about this the other day, and I've had had fourteen jobs in my life. I only applied for two of them, and even the Hubble job, someone came to me to do it. I didn't apply for it. So when you have when you have a track record of doing the right thing, people will come and ask you to do jobs. And then the then the question is, are you competent to do it? And I, with my degrees, I think I was. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I can relate to that. We, I'm coaching um, a number of scientists um, here at Open Door Coaching and, and they tell the same story that the, the, the jobs, so-called jobs have just landed in their laps. They haven't actually planned <laughs> their careers, but it comes back to what you're saying, their character and competence. Yes, yeah. And you talk about um, commitment and focus and what other, what other leadership traits do you think you really had to bring to those moments and that you've brought to different moments in your career? You know, I, 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 I think... Uh, I'm, I'm a behaviorist. Okay. I, I, I think that if you're not, if you're not changing behavior, you're not doing anything useful. And that's this. So there's a way of thinking and I, I kind of like the way Elon Musk puts this. He's a physicist also. And he talked about, he told people he wanted to electrify transportation. And they said, uh, he said, that's impossible. And he says, why? And he said, because it costs $600 per kilowatt to make a battery. And he said, oh, you're reasoning by analogy. So physicists like to reason by first principles, not by analogy. So the first principle way of thinking about this is, he said, what would it cost me to go to the options exchange and buy the material for that battery? $80. So the difference between 80 and 600 is just a packaging problem. And that's what he worked on. So I'm always back to first principles here. And the, the, the first principles that I'm working on are, are the deepest human needs. And the first one, and the most important behavior is to meet people's need to feel appreciated. It's mm -hmm. a very deep need. And with you, if you practice this a while and make it a habit, it's life changing. So things like that, uh, simple things. I'm, you know, physicists love simple. Albert Einstein said once, everything's made as simple as possible, but not more so. So it's a, uh, so, so the simple thing is, the number one need is, the, is an emotional need, which surprised me at first, to feel appreciated. And the, the, the next need right on the heels of it is our need to feel included. And that's what our tribalism is about. You know, we're very tri we're the most tribal animal on earth. We get in tribes about politics, sporting events, uh, all these things, nationality. <clears throat> and so I, I think these, the, the only with other people can we meet the need to feel appreciated and need to feel included. And those are those are two paramount needs that it, it, this might analogy might not work, but with with f equals m a, I, I could I can write equations, put a lander on the moon. That's that's how physics works. We derive things from simple things. The same way with these core needs, we can figure out what behaviors we need to have and and how to do them. Yes, absolutely. And do you think? Um what do you think then, Charlie, in terms of the times that we're going through in the world at the moment? Are they still, they're, they're the two major things we need to be focused on, leaders need to be focused on right now with their teams? You know, it's, it's interesting. In the U.S., we've got two extreme contrasts. We've got the uh, governor of New York State, Andrew Cuomo, who's on a video every day now and has an approval rating in the country of like 90%. And, and what he's doing is he's just doing exactly what I said. It's very sensible, calm, and empathetic. Uh, so if, if you ask me two qualities of leaders, I'd say the ability to be accountable, and that's a choice, and, the, and to be able to empathize. Mm -hmm. And he does both of those things. And one of the most beautiful things he did the other day that just got me 
someone said, how do you, how do you rate your performance on, in doing and managing the state through this thing? He said, doing my best. I thought, what a brilliant answer. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I like that. Right. What more can you ask for, really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that you're doing your best. Yeah. And, and if uh, you... Yeah. Go on, go on. So, so, so the, 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 let's talk about accountability for a minute. This mm -hmm. is choosing to be, uh, to, to, to be uh, I, don't, I don't want to say the word accountable again, it's choosing to answer for the consequences of your actions. And if you can make that choice, that's really important. And, and people who can't make that choice, I think, are, are doomed to failure. And empathy. There's a great video clip recently I, I saw, and I've got it in my workshop, of a guy that came in, um, uh, the, the, the CEO of Microsoft, when the company was failing. And he said the number one thing he learned is to be empathetic. He said, we, we, we need to pr provide what our customers need, and we can't know what that is unless we can empathize with them. So mm -hmm. accountability and empathize is, 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 is key things here. Yeah. Simple stuff, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's so important. And I, if I'm thinking back to the social context you talked about with Hubble, would you say that was what was missing amongst the project teams? Oh, absolutely. That, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so so the, the, the social context was, was uh, the opposite of appreciation. It was criticism. Mm. Uh, criticism at every level at every about everything and so people's needs weren't being met and when when that need isn't met the, what happens is that the social context starts to fail and you lose mutual respect when you lose mutual respect you lose your capacity to to acknowledge unfortunate realities the unfortunate reality is that the mirror error was seen in data at park and elmer we they knew something was not right Mm. They, they rationalized it with cognitive bias. In other words, what they did was that in their brain, uh, the engineer's brain, they, they couldn't allow themselves to process that the mirror might be flawed. So they did a calculation that showed this was caused by the mirror sagging in 1G. But the, the thing that really got Lou Allen, the, the chairman of the failure review board, was he could understand that uh, this confirmation bias is a condition of humans and you got to fight it all the time. What, what, what he, the question he asked was, why didn't <coughs> the science working group, or NASA science working group, demand additional testing because they knew about spherical aberration. Mm. I mean, they, they knew very well. And the answer was, Perkin Elmer never, Perkin Elmer never told us. So he's, the question he said was, why didn't they share this? And I, I'm looking back on it, I think that if I had been in a, a more thoughtful, appreciative to the management I'm working with, I might have sat down for a beer and somebody almost said, Charlie, you know, I'm kind of worried about that mirror. Mm -hmm. If those words came out, that test would be done. But those words were never uttered because everything that they said, they, they got, not, not, not necessarily by me, the whole agency. So in the first days of me taking the, the job, uh, the, the Hubble had its first big overrun and the administrator and I, at that time, Jim Beggs, flew in his, his NASA one airplane all around the country so he could stop and scream at contractors. And so that's, that's what I saw. And I thought, that's how it's done. But later, I, I didn't take much later. I figured out that's not how it's done. Mm -hmm. that, that, doesn't, that doesn't get people to do what I think is the most important thing to be willing to, to voice unfortunate realities. That's a big part. So in, in, my, in my work, I, I linked the 100% commitment with the addressing unfortunate realities, because that creates creativity, and put those two behaviors together. And the unfortunate reality in a situation I was in with the, with the the, uh, the failed mirror, and I, I usually comment on this, was if I can't fix this telescope, my career is gone anyway. So what have I got to lose? You know, I just mm. it's a no-brainer. And I think you know, going back to that time, I think unconsciously. I, I sort of processed that there was no one else in the world that could do it. I had, I had the, the resource base. I had the, the, the authority base. I had the uh, scientific background. I had the intention. So there was nobody else that could have done, no, no one else could have, would have reprogrammed $60 million. Oh, so this is kind of fun. So some of my friends were talking about that time uh, about a couple of years ago. And they gave me a deep insight. They said, you know, what, what would have happened 
<clears throat> if, if instead of doing that, she said, Charlie, you know, go put a, a, a repair thing in the budget request and I'll deal with it when it comes through. If, if, I, if she had said that, that's likely what I would have done. And if I'd done that, it would have been there two or three years later and Hubble's gyroscopes were failing and with the telescope would be tumbling and it would have failed. So she gave me a gift. What she said to me in retrospect was, was a gift to all of us because once the telescope stopped, started tumbling, you could not approach it with the shuttle too dangerous and grab it. Yeah, so she gave you that gift of saying, you can't do it and you will not do it. I forbid you. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I see Charlie going, just watch me. I have to. You have to. You're committed. You're accountable. Um, you're focused. You have to do it. Yeah. have to yeah. do it. Yeah. That's exactly right. You have to do it. And someone is actually, uh, we've got a lot of people from our Australian Air Force um, listening to us, mm. um, Charlie, and and uh, someone has mentioned actually, was it not the same, what you're talking about there, the um, contractor's inability to actually voice the unfortunate realities, was that not the same thing that happened with Challenger as well? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I can, I, can, I can rattle these cases off all day about social context. Mm. Uh, so, so what happened with Challenger in, in a short version is the space shuttle in the minds of the human side of NASA, human flight side, is the space shuttle was NASA. Without the space shuttle, NASA doesn't exist. And it was marketed as cheap access to space going to fly 50 times a year. Well, at the time of Challenger, it was flying 10 times a year. And the budget, more or less constant, so it was the most expensive way to go to space. So the pressure to get the launch rate up was immense. And so in, in that social context, what happened is a, there's a great book by a lady named Diane Vaughn, I read later, called The Challenger Launch Decision. And she said that they, they got into a place she called normalization of deviance with that social pressure where they gradually demand, demanded a much less rigorous case to, uh, to continue to launch than to delay the launch. And they didn't notice it. And so I thought when I first was involved with Challenger, I had a, I had a payload in the cargo bay of Challenger, so it was close and personal for me too. I thought I thought my colleagues had not understood the properties of the rubber material at this extreme temperature. Mm. That's not what happened. They knew that the technical data were in front of them. So the question was, why did they launch when they knew they shouldn't? And that's where the social context comes in. Same thing, if the people in the Air Force, go, go, go take a look at the 737 MAX decisions. That's a social context failure, completely. That plane may never fly, I don't know. And the, the explosion of Fukushima Daiichi, uh, that, I was in contact with the, uh, the Japanese professor, Todai, who, who did that uh, failure review board for the government. And he and I had several emails because I've got mutual friends in the same university. And he said that was a social context failure. It was not, it was, it was not caused by the tsunami. It was not caused by the, by the uh, uh, earthquake. It was caused by, by Japanese insularity. That they, that they had been told over and over and over, get those generators up the hill, and they didn't do it, okay? And blind obedience to authority, the same. So, so there's these common ingredients, uh, undue deference to uh, more senior people caused a crash at Tenerife and worst, worst aviation fatality in history and caused Korean Airlines to crash at 17 times normal rates for four years and went on for four years before somebody figured out it was a social failure. They kept, they kept thinking it was technical. They kept putting pilots in trainers, I um, mean, simulators, and they, with the person watching, they could do it. So, yeah, it's... <laughs> it's yeah, and, and I, think, um, I, I think a lot of people on the line can relate to um, what you're talking about, Charlie, because we all work um, with a lot of technical people. So I'm working with scientists and coaching scientists and, you know, there's Air Force people on the line that are working with, with you know, the nuts and bolts and the technicals. But, but truly what you're really focusing on us focusing us on today is about the people side of it. The people's need to feel appreciated, need to feel included, need to be accountable. Um, yeah, and then yeah. the traits that we need to demonstrate as leaders to bring those qualities right. out. Yeah, by the way, speaking of the Air Force, my father was a career Air Force pilot. And uh, I spent most of my life on air bases someplace in the world. In fact, I've lived in 44 locations and only two in the last 40 years. 
<laughs> right, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Actually, actually, I was going to ask you about that. Do you, like, you know, given all your experience um, with Hubble and at NASA and, um, you know, you were the um, director of astrophysics at NASA, do you still gaze at the stars, Charlie? You know, I'm, I'm not very interested in astronomy. Okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> my, my field is astrophysics. And so I, I enjoy the imagery, I think, uh, like the public does, but maybe a little more. But, but the optical astronomy is not my background. I'm a, I'm a uh, solar physics and gamma ray astronomer. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my technical background, but I, I will tell you my, my, my three favorite things about Hubble. Uh, so so, so the, the physicists can write a single equation today Theoretical physicist, I'm, I'm an experimental physicist. Theoretical, single equation you put on a t-shirt. And this equation will describe everything that happens on Earth. It's gonna be good probably for a thousand years. Uh, there's, it's got, there may be some little tiny nuance, but not important to anybody but physicists. You can, it includes relativity, quantum mechanics, all these things are in there. But here's what's fascinating. It explains less than 5% of what's in the universe. And the other 95%, 26% is what's called the dark matter. It should be called invisible matter. We've known about this since I was in graduate school. And what happens is on every scale, there's too much gravity. And the, the leading idea is that there's some particle we don't know about yet that's heavy and doesn't interact very much. But the, nobody really knows the answer to that. And th that was perplexing enough. But then comes along dark energy, which you mentioned in your film clip. And so if, if you throw a ball in the air, what happens is the, the kinetic energy gets converted to potential energy. It slows down, then it comes back down. So when I was in graduate school, the idea was we knew the universe was expanding, but we thought it's expanding ever more slowly, just like the ball in the air, and it's going to collapse back on itself. What Hubble confirmed was it's like you throw the ball in the air and it accelerates farther and farther away. And so... Uh, this means that the universe is just going to go black. It'll get darker and darker. It'll get farther and farther away. In the end, you won't see anything. There's nobody knows how this works. So this is a, the, the, there's only one calculation that I'm aware of that's relevant, and that's what's called the quantum energy of vacuum. It's off by 10 to the 50th power. That's a big er error even for astrophysics. So, so this is what really fascinates me. But my favorite image is the deep field. And the reason that I, I love that, it's been done four times, I love that picture, is that uh, we, we looked at this black spot in space and, it's, and the galaxies, and you can take the solid, solid angle, we call it, of, of that angle, and you can count, because it's, it's, it's called a deep field, means it exposed a long time, goes very far back in time. And that upped our estimate of number of galaxies by a factor of 10. There's two trillion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars. Let your mind wrap around that. So that image produces a really interesting, simple science result. <laughs> Two trillion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars. Yeah, I can't wrap my mind around that, but I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful that you can, Charlie, because you can't. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. There's, um, I'm just conscious of our time, and there's some really great questions coming through from the, from the chat box, if, I, if you don't mind if sure. I pick them up. And just as I do that, I'll just post the... Um, I'll just flick to the, um, this is um, Hubble's 30th anniversary photos. So we'll mm -hmm. have a look at this amazing image as, as we think about these questions. And Sam's asked a really good question. We're going back to your comments around empathy. So you did talk to us um, about accountable and, um, and um, you talked to us about empathy as well. Um, and she's asking, she said that she thinks many leaders and people actually confuse what empathy means and what it means to be, to, to have empathy as a leader or to be empathetic. So would you mind expanding on that, Charlie, what your views are around I, I, the importance I, of leadership and empathy? I, I think it's feeling with others. Mm. It's, 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 being able, it's being able to, so that's a little, little joke, okay? Uh, but well, walk, before you criticize me, walk a mile in my shoes, Mm. One, you'll be a mile away, too far away for you to hit me. And second, I'll have your shoes. <laughs> That's right. I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> but empathy is the thing. I, 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 I would expand it to include what people are thinking also. And so it, it means to be able to put your mind in the place of what's going on with the other person. I think it's, it's that simple to describe it. 
but as far as operationally how to do it, I don't have an easy an easy route to that except just to be it's about being willing to do that and that's a place of some vulnerability because you're going to have to have the emotions and, and even thoughts that maybe are uncomfortable but uh that's i think i think that's really really important and, mm. and people who can do it do well again back to this example of this governor uh every time he talks he 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 talks about the how, how deeply he feels about the people who've died with the virus and and how how courageous the the um people who 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 go to work every day and drive drive the subways and go mm. into the hospitals and risk their lives taking care of sick people and he, he lets himself go into the space of just the feeling of of how how much gratitude he has the people would do this because as he points out you can't make anybody do this they've got to be willing to do it Mm. So, uh, to, to just stop and, and reflect on, on people doing great things, probably a, a really good thing to do once in a while as we go through this really difficult thing. Yeah, absolutely. That moment to stop and reflect. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and as you said, when, when you're stopping and reflecting, then you, um, you know, you're appreciating people, you're making them feel appreciated. You're making them feel included. Uh, and that's, yeah. that's what you're talking about right there. That's right. It's always back to those basics. Yep. Yeah. And the other question I was, I was thinking about um, when you were thinking about and talking about empathy was um, the role of vulnerability in leadership as well. And it sounds to me the, the stories you're sharing, um, moments where um, leaders are expressing, expressing vulnerability that they don't have all the answers. They, like they can fix things, but they don't have all the answers. So have you got any thoughts about that, Charlie, in terms of the role of vulnerability in leadership? Yeah, I think it's another really important thing because it's it's a, it's a connecting thing, isn't it? When when you're when you're willing to be vulnerable, you know, if if you uh, I take the converse is true, if you're not willing to ever be vulnerable, you won't get the connection, you won't get the empathy, you won't get the appreciation. So yeah, I think that's these are all you know important things. And as technical people, as scientists, um, you know, who are mostly focused on, you know, the well, they're focused on the technical. How do they how do they tap into that? Do you think, or how how do we how do we enable them to to tap into that so that they can be more well rounded leaders? All of us, really. So, what's interesting to me, I, I use this quarter system like a formula, and you can it's emotional and thinking. So it's about EQ and IQ, which is more important for a successful marriage, EQ or IQ? What do you think? I think both actually, but probably probably our emotional EQ. intelligence. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what's what's interesting interesting thing is that when I uh, my company had this big contract, and I, uh, I I went and to each NASA center and asked who was the most effective leader manager I ever worked with at that center, and they all came to work with me. All but one was an emotional decider. And so what happens is I think that if you're born naturally, I have a big piece about innate personality. If you're born naturally an emotional decider and you go like all of us did, you go to graduate school or, or engineering school, you pick up the logical side. So you got them both. People like me that live on the logical side, I had to have a lot of hard lessons to take me over to the emotional side. And one of the, one of, one of the uh, things that I had, a, had a worked for a, a boss at the time who was a, also a very good friend, another scientist, uh, we, we liked each other, did a performance review one day and he said, Charlie, you would do better if you could learn to suffer fools gladly. <laughs> and that got to me. And I, I said, okay, I've got to go work on the relationship side of my life uh, with people. And that was transformative. So, mm -hmm. you know, but I think those, I, th I think the problem is this scientist, you know, we're, we're this is what I do in my workshops is basically a lot, enormous amount about EQ, but where else do you get it in life other than the family? It's, it's, stuff's not taught in schools in the U.S. Mm -hmm. The family doesn't bring it. And then people who, who completely live on the logical side, uh, they're just horrible. I mean, they don't, they don't ever connect with people mm. and people don't feel included by them. Yeah. So I, I, I used to have scientists work for me and uh, some of them uh, 
had great difficulty being good managers. And I said, here's the storyline. You've got to be able to run to be able to be a good manager. You've got to, to let people who work for you do the job less well than you can do it and appreciate them for doing what they're doing. If you can't do that, you'll never succeed. <laughs> and tell them that you appreciate them as tell well. Them. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and yeah, I think, I think in, a, in, a, in a marriage, there's nothing more important than habitual appreciation. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, I was doing a workshop and I was telling a story about giving this guy some champagne. I was doing a workshop in Shanghai some years ago and first raised his hand and said, Charlie, you know, you can do that kind of thing, but I have no money at the end of the month. So a little research into this and gestures are actually more powerful than words, doing things that are gestures. Like uh, you, in, in most marriages, people have their jobs, right? So to go do the other person's job or go up and open a door or, or ask, can I help you? Uh, this I think is actually carries more weight than the verb, verbal part. Yes, yeah, for sure, I agree. And Charlie, there's lots of questions coming in, so I'll do my best to try to pick them up as well. And and uh, people, a lot of people have um, have commented around authentic authenticity. So, mm -hmm. um, could you perhaps um, share some thoughts around um, the importance of um, leaders being authentic, um, and particularly around you know difficult times that we're facing as well? You know, there's an old joke, uh, a salesman joke. Uh, it's easiest to be authentic when you can fake it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, uh, authenticity is essential to I, I, absolutely so. And I think it, it, it's all bundled up in integrity and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so sure, I, well, I, I, don't, I don't teach authenticity specifically, but it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's, my work circulates around it. Let's say it that way. It's very important. If you're not authentic, no one's going to, so, here, here, so here's, here's how people become inauthentic. Uh, so under stress, they, we, we all have personas. We, we develop personas in, in the childhood and we do it for, you often have two, one to avoid pain and one to gain love. And if you get under too much stress and fear and you go into your persona, what will happen is people will not feel connected with you and you'll feel inauthentic. When you're inauthentic, you're failing to me their need to feel included. So that will drive them away from you. It goes back to the basic authenticity is about me being in a, in a place where you, you can, well, you will feel included by me. That's the essence of that. Mm. People who don't feel included, <clears throat> if, they, if they feel excluded, like you're really inauthentic, they'll act out anger. Uh, the, the, uh, it's, it's very clear that, uh, and I've got, so, so oftentimes I get a question in the workshop, uh, Charlie, you know, I know this works in the U.S. How do you know that, that uh, people in China have these needs? So I show videos of capuchin monkeys. When a capuchin monkey gets a lesser form of food, instead of eating it, they throw it at the, <laughs> at the, 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 the scientist. So the, this authenticity is essential to meeting the, this very basic inclusion need. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just reflecting on, um, on, on leadership and failures of leadership and how that that, that connection you've made there, um, Charlie, around inclusiveness and and authenticity and um, and having people feel appreciated and empathy. There's there's a lovely kind of connection to all of those mm -hmm. elements. I think, yeah. Yeah, I've written lots of notes. I'll be reflecting and listening to the video again <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Are there any other major um, things that you feel like you need to share with us right now? Like what else should well, we take I, away I, from I think listening if, to you? If you, want, if you want to go ahead and con uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, and you can email me at charlie, C-H-R-L-I-E, Pellerin, no punctuation, at gmail.com. And I'll, I'll answer your emails if you have questions. Or if it's a lengthy one, we can set up a Zoom talk or something. So I don't have to type too much. Yeah, that's great I'm as happy, well. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to do that and, and be there for you. And also, if you want the workshop materials, it's a 500 PowerPoint slides. It's a, 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 it's a textbook. It's a, a, so, so yeah, let me talk about one other thing that's kind of fun in our, my work. So I, I, I developed a lot of the material when I was working as a consultant. 
uh, part-time for aerospace companies. And the fun part about that was I could, they usually would do my workshop after they got to know me and I could watch them back at work what they use. So again, experimental physicists, what do I see them using back at work? That stays in the workshop and things that they didn't seem to be using or weren't important, those, those went away over, over time. So <clears throat> the, um, uh, well, these, these were really smart people that my, my, my clients were. These, these were really, really sharp. And what I discovered was that they, they wouldn't call me with a problem that could be solved because if it could be solved, they're smart enough, they could do it. So I thought this Einstein thing, he said, <clears throat> you cannot solve a, a, a problem with the thinking that created it. And so I said, I said, you cannot solve a problem in the context that created it. So I made a, 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 a worksheet called the Context Shifting Worksheet, where you can start with a situation and progress through the, all the elements of the 4D system. You do it in about an hour if it's just one person online doing it. And my coaches, when I had a bunch of them, uh, many of them used, used the Context Shifting Worksheet for every coaching session. But so, so in, my, in my workshops, I always, uh, at the end of every day, I, I ask for a plus delta card, plus what works for you today, Delta, uh, what, what would you like to change for tomorrow? And so early on, the, the deltas that I got most often were, <clears throat> we want the workshop to be about us. We don't want a generic workshop. So I got the idea to embed the context shifting worksheet in the workshop. So that every, uh, in the US, I only work with intact teams and, and in Asia, it's more big groups. So <clears throat> by the way, in the past year, I think I've done workshops in Germany, Nova Cybris, Siberia, China, Japan. So anyway, so I embed the context shifting worksheet and they pick a situation. And it's often something like, we can't communicate with each other. We don't trust each other. For the public workshops is I cannot communicate with or motivate my children. And, and so during the workshop, we, we, we go through this and they, they actually come out at the end of the three days with an action plan for something that they thought was insoluble when they started and things to do. And so the context shifting worksheet is another interesting element of this. Mm. And as you say, those um, resources are available. Um, they're available uh, yeah, on, on your line. And I, I saw it um, in the book as well. So you can pick it up from the book as well. I can, I yeah. can send everything in. And in, in the, the, the current version of the context shifting worksheet, very early on, it's exactly the process that I talked about in, in the Hubble thing. It says, when you think about the situation, which emotions come up for you? And then what storylines are powering them? Which red storylines are powering them? And then the next one is, what's a green storyline you can replace it with? And now how do you feel? So that, that kind of thing's right bedded in every workshop now. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's see. Um... Uh, there's a couple of uh, I totally agree and, and I like that as a, just a little um, a little process flow because we can do that straight away we can do that instantly and, and so many times in different contexts and environments that we find ourselves in absolutely um, there's one more a um, couple more questions Charlie I'm just watching the time for us as well because we, we, we know we could talk to you all day <laughs> and all night <laughs> so in your evening anyway um, uh, one of our, um, our Air Force colleagues has said um, that NASA, like Air Force, um, have a very strong cultural norms that can drive people to be bystanders. Um, coming back to your comment about character, um, how does Charlie see us building resilience around character? You know, it's, 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 it's about the habituating behaviours. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, the, another thing in the workshop, I, I have a slide early on that said, you know, raise your hand if you've had success changing other people and a few hands go up. And then I said, next line says, raise your hand if you had success changing your spouse and a couple of hands will go up. And I asked a lady one time, how'd you do it? She said, divorce. <laughs> and I said, not what I had in mind. And so what I say is, this is kind of jokingly, this is the workshop about you changing you. The workshop to change other people is down the hall. And so don't let your attention wander off of how you behave. As Gandhi said, we must be the change we want to see in the world. Even with that slide there, people raise their hand and say, well, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so is doing this, that, and the other. I said, that's, that's the wrong workshop. That's, that's the other one down the hall. This workshop's about you changing you. So I think if you tend to yourself with how you behave, 
which will drive the social context you create. Uh, that's that's all you need to do. It's all you can do. Yes, and as leaders, we're responsible for that social context and and how we behave and the social context. Take responsibility for that. So I'm I'm very big into feedback loops. Uh, mm. I like forward feedback loops. And so here's what happens: if you, for example, decide you're going to uh, appreciate more. What will happen is the social context field that behavior creates will make it easier for other people to appreciate. And then when they do more, it'll build and build and build. So th these are these are forward feed feedback loops between behaviors and context, make behaviors easier, come back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, there's a lots of questions I could ask you about that <laughs> as well. But it, it just brings up one more question, I think, around the importance of feedback then for, for leaders. And as you said, um, that you actually have the courage to hear the voice of unfortunate realities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, uh, again, I just watched this governor this morning and he's, he's a genius, frankly, but he, he spoke for about five minutes about how his children are criticizing his his uh, explanatory style. And he's trying to explain the need to wear face masks. And he said, what I agreed to do was we're gonna make it uh, a open competition for anyone to come up with a better, better way to explain why you gotta wear face masks. And if you win, we'll, we'll produce your, your thing in a video and give you credit. <laughs> <laughs> So very open to feedback from, from a lot of people by the sounds yes. of it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, Charlie, um, what can we say? Uh, there's, there's a lot of people on the line and there's a lot of people that will listen to your uh, recording and your wisdom um, for a long time after our session today. Um, I would just like to thank you on behalf of uh, the team at Synergy Global and the team at Open Door Coaching. Um, the chat's been flooded with thanks uh, to you from around the world and um, I think you're a, such an incredibly generous man um, you know who's given so much to the world through your science and your your um, your technical abilities, but I think what you've given to us from a leadership point of view um, and what you're reminding us about from a leadership point of view today is, is probably the most um, generous gift you've given us. So I'm, I'm very grateful and thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to appreciate you. you asked really good questions and made a good thread of logic. So thank you and thank all the participants for spending time to come. Yeah, wonderful. Well, there's, you're getting thanks. Um, it, people say an extraordinary kickoff to our day. It's a finish of your day and finish of day for some people. But um, yeah, people are saying um, what an insightful session and thank you and 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 the like. So I'll um, I'll uh, stop the recording, but we can pick up those messages of thanks as we go as we go along as well. So again, Charlie, on behalf of everyone. Um, our gratitude to you and, uh, and our gratitude to Hubble for the amazing uh, images that you're bringing us as well. My pleasure. Thank you.